this it kind of started yesterday. Like yesterday, I just woke up and I was really depressed, but I don't know why. The recent revelations are nothing new. I'm just an okay player that was able to play okay. I, like I'm so sad right now. I, uh. Naomi Osaka has been open about her struggles. I feel for Naomi. I feel like uh, I wish I could give her a hug because I know what it's like. Anyone that knows me knows I'm introverted. And anyone that has seen me at the tournaments will notice that I'm often wearing headphones as that helps dull my social anxiety. I get really nervous and find it stressful to always try to engage and give the best answers I can. In an Instagram post, she laid it out for everyone. The 23-year-old revealing she's, quote, suffered long bouts of depression since the U.S. Open in 2018, and I have a really hard time coping with that. And yet, even with her being so honest, media, predominantly the old guard of white males like Piers Morgan were none too pleased and responded viciously. It all started when Osaka, the second ranked player in the world, announced she would not partake in press conferences. She cited her mental health and told the world she has suffered because of it in the past. The press at these tournaments, and this is not the first time that this has been said, certainly by women athletes in particular, that there is a tremendous amount of pressure that's put on these players by the media themselves, particularly in France. In effect, she was fined $15,000 for skipping her mandatory press conference all four Grand Slams, including the clay courts of Roland Garros, touted the potential for a suspension and sanctions levied against her just because she would not take questions. I'm much more interested in the tennis than how she feels afterwards. I mean, it's just, it's really stunning. It's almost like they want, it, this is what it felt like to me reading this letter from the four tournaments, that they're putting a line in the sand and saying, not only will we not accept this from Naomi Osaka, we're not going to accept this from anybody. So Osaka responded. She withdrew from the French Open, citing reasons we played above in this clip. As the post wrote, it was a dramatic exit. I think now the best thing for the tournament, the other players, and my well-being is that I withdraw so that everyone can get back to focusing on the tennis going on in Paris, she said. This is Gilles Moretin. He is the French Tennis Federation president. After Osaka's decision, Moretin, in pure hypocritical fashion, held a presser, read out a statement in French, then read out the same statement in English, called Naomi Osaka's withdrawal unfortunate, then left without taking a single question from the press. Seeing Moretin of the French Tennis Federation calling a presser, reading a statement, but refusing to take any questions. Ironic doesn't quite cover it, wrote Joe Malloy in a spot on post. Naomi Osaka said she had written to tournament officials privately to apologize for the distraction she had created and had offered to speak with them after the tourney about potentially changing rules requiring players to engage with the media that she described as outdated. Before returning to the tour, she said, she would discuss with tournament officials ways they could make things better for the players. The schedule is virtually year-round and non-stop. The travel can be isolating. The results are never based on a teammate's play or a coach's decision, but on a single person's effectiveness on a given day or over two weeks. Professional tennis is almost designed to foster mental health issues. Dismiss them at your own peril. In terms of this current you know, situation, we're seeing a lot of stress. A lot of students are trying to readjust to being back in a full time space. So here in California, at least in the district I work in, we're back in person and we're back full time. You know, we're talking like 30 something students in a classroom setting, you know, trying to, you know, navigate the academic possible loss as well as those social etiquette losses as well. You know, once again, we've been out of this space in terms of in person learning for a year plus in some of our districts across the, you know, the United States and so forth too. So it's a lot of relearning, relearning behaviors, relearning how to, you know, navigate these spaces in terms of academic demands, you know, and just relearning to interact with each other, you know, as you know, humans trying to still navigate this ever, you know, evolving situation that we're still in, in terms of this pandemic and so forth. So a lot of my school psychology, you know, colleagues, you know, in my district, my social work colleagues, school counselors and so forth too, all we're doing is trying to inform people about the trauma, whether that's the trauma that you're experiencing with this current pandemic or the trauma that you bring into your space from your history and the consistent messaging that you're getting online and offline. We're just trying to you know, navigate these spaces and inform people about that trauma and empower our youth one day at a time.
And what was something during COVID when you are still continuing trying to work with these children, but in a remote way, what was something that you think got really lost in the conversation when it comes to children's mental health during a pandemic type remote learning situation? Well, I think what gets lost in that kind of struggle is realizing the struggle that our families are going through as well. My district as you know, general, we've actually been pretty aware in trying to give child care and trying to hire more additional social emotional supports and so forth too. But I can't say that for every district in the United States, right? So I think you know some of the things that get lost is that how this is a new era that we're living in and to have expectations of the same old way of doing things. The grades, the assessments, the state testing, the mandates that come down in terms of attendance and things of that nature. That get lost from the top in terms of a systems approach and not really realizing that this is a great opportunity to reinvent this system. To really listen to students stories, their narratives, their history and really build community. Because once again, we're all going through this. We might be experiencing this pandemic in different ways and different you know, you know, know, kind of interpretations and so forth too. But we're all experiences this together, this new quote unquote normal. I hate that phrase, because what is normal? <laughs> it's a social <laughs> construct, right? But yes. at the end of the day, we know that that's the phrase that is being tossed out there. And we got to be real respectful of the fact that our students are trying to navigate that with limited experiences to begin with in this life to begin with.